I'm CBS 8's Jenny Day. Welcome to Around San Diego. I'll get you caught up on a week's worth of news and look ahead in just 30 minutes. We begin with your money and the recent spike in your electricity bill. Here we are today suffering under the super agenda of gigantic energy costs. Yeah, angry SDG&E customers are taking action, fed up with their sky-high gas bills. From the local level and now to the federal level, Californians are demanding answers as to what is driving these price hikes. The California Public we Utilities Commission held a hearing just this week. Our political reporter Morgan Reiner was there for all of it. The panel of experts ran through some of the more obvious reasons why utility bills might be higher and then some more unusual ones. The public comment, though, they were not having it. They are blaming California and its utility companies. For weeks now, we've been bringing you stories of people with astronomical utility bills. January bill was $664. More chimed in today. I have small children at home. I'm holding their little cold hands. It breaks my heart. Hoping they would get a good reason why. Regulators and industry experts ran through a host of reasons that can explain the record prices. First, it got colder earlier. A combination of factors contributed to these higher winter prices, including cold weather in the West, uh, higher gas demand for heating was required. Natural gas storage in California needs improvements. Storage facilities need to be maintained to help gas and electric service reliability during peak periods of demands. Occasional pipeline outages. California imports about 90% of its natural gas from out of state. And outdated pipeline infrastructure. The state's pipeline system has remained relatively unchanged in the last 10 years, and many pipelines in California are over 50 years old. But despite all of those reasons, some pointed out there are still irregularities. I do think there's enough there that's worth uh, looking into. Um, there are some other things around the edges, you know, some... Some of it has to do with when we uh, na nominate gas for our units and then when the Kaiser market clears, um, the timing doesn't match up. And are happy Governor Gavin Newsom has called for a federal investigation. I recognize and support the governor's request to federal regulators. But people who called in to give their two cents said the state and its regulators should look at itself first. You and the governor are the ones forcing California ratepayers to pay the cost of your extreme fixation on climate change. You failed to observe that the CPUC sets the rates and forces the providers to charge what they do. We are on to you. Members of the panel today expressed that this was just the first of many conversations to come, and the governor just called for a federal investigation yesterday. So we will stay on top of these ongoing developments for you. Yeah, definitely we will. So if you are struggling right now to pay your SDG&E bill, the company says there's federal money available that can help if you qualify. The funding is meant for low-income families. How much you can get depends on how much you make, household size, and your past due balance. SDG&E says that people need to apply soon because most of it expires by June. As for people who might not qualify, SDG&E says to reach out to them directly and the company will craft a tailored solution to help you. Meantime, Sharp Healthcare had to contact more than 60,000 patients who had their information hacked. The healthcare provider announced that it recently learned that someone had gained access to a file containing some patient's information. This includes names and recent payments. Sharp says the data breach did not include information like services received or social security numbers. Sharp recommended affected patients review statements they receive from their healthcare providers and contact sharp immediately if you see charges for services that you did not receive. Well, help from the United States is on the way to one of the deadliest natural disasters to unfold this century. First responders in Turkey and Syria are still holding out hope that more people could be found underneath crushed apartment towers and houses. The death toll has now surpassed 15,000. Rescue teams are fanned out across the two countries trying to find people as they hear voices underneath those mountains of debris. Two U.S. task forces comprised of more than 100 first responders specializing in urban search and rescue are being dispatched, one from L.A. and one from Virginia. Meantime, back here at home, CBS 8's Rocio de la Fe spoke to two local families whose loved ones were deeply impacted by those earthquakes and the aftermath. 
I spoke to two people whose loved ones are still unaccounted for following the deadly earthquake in Turkey. They tell me their hopes of hearing from them are diminishing with each passing day. A total of 10 cities in the southern portion of Turkey and parts of Syria are now faced with utter devastation. We can't sleep well. We keep checking messages like if people are still alive or not. And I'm checking my friends' messages as well. Like it's not only my family, it's the whole city, 10 cities and thousands of people. The monster 7.8 magnitude earthquake was one of the largest to ever hit Turkey. It triggered countless aftershocks, including a massive 7.5 quake. We're all devastated. It's been such a nightmare. And saying nightmare is even good because nightmare is not real. This is real. Melik Fasisi lives in San Diego and is desperately trying to hear from her cousin and her family who live in this 10-story building in Hatay that collapsed. Only a handful of people have been rescued from the rubble. There's still people yelling and we don't know how long they could survive. Adil Khan is one of the many San Diegans impacted by the disaster. His father and mother-in-law are trapped underneath the rubble where their home once stood. We are hearing voices from her father, but not from her mother. This heartbreaking video was taken by the couple's son as he desperately tries to search for them. Kian's wife, Rana, flew to Turkey after learning what happened and is hoping to help search for her parents. Meanwhile, Kian is in San Diego looking after their seven-year-old son. It's hard. I mean, I would like to be with my wife, but I cannot do it right now. The aftershocks, freezing temperatures and damaged roads are hampering rescuers' efforts to reach towns and cities affected. There's no electricity, there's no water, there's no food. So even if they try to go and help those people, they're going to be struggling. The World Health Organization fears the number of dead could climb to more than 20,000. We need help. This is a time to help no matter who you are, no matter where you're from. The local Turkish community is asking for donations of any kind to help those impacted. To find out how to help, visit our website, cbs8.com, and click the Help button. Rocio de la Fe, CBS 8. Rocio, thanks, and, and truly just hearts are heavy worldwide. Well, San Diego is preparing for an influx of migrants as Title 42 is expected to expire. Title 42 allowed the United States to quickly deport migrants seeking asylum. The pandemic era policy is anticipated to end when the national COVID-19 public health emergency ends this May. Jewish Family Services is leading the efforts to shelter migrants here. The county is working to create a response plan to make sure that asylum seekers and refugees have the resources that they need so that San Diego is ready the moment that this policy is lifted. I just highlight the opportunity that there, there are other levels of government that um, could step forward to, to support the situation. Yeah, and again, that emergency um, declaration ends on May 11th. There are still court decisions that must be made to allow Title 42 to end. And two separate boats believed to be involved in human smuggling operations washed up on our coast Wednesday. Lifeguards tell us around 25 people ran to shore. Only five people were apprehended. A pongo was reported near Ocean Street in Carlsbad. It was abandoned, but 17 life jackets were found on board. Just hours later, Later, an overcrowded fishing boat showed up on the shores of South Mission Beach. I spoke to a Border Patrol agent who said in fiscal year 2019, 660 migrants were apprehended off of our coast. Last year, there were more than 2,500 apprehensions made by our local sector out at sea. really don't know who these folks are. There are a lot of folks that are um, economic migrants that just want to come here for a better life. But with those same folks, you have uh, criminals. Border Patrol says the migrants who landed on the beach typically have a getaway car waiting to take them to a stash house. As we have seen before, this is a highly profitable business for smugglers, with some people paying as much as $20,000 to make it into the U.S. Agents say they do the best that they can with the resources that they have and are grateful for the many partner agencies. Well, two U.S. Army veterans who were once deported are now U.S. citizens. Mauricio Hernandez Mata and Leonel Contreras are both from Mexico and were allowed to return to the U.S. under a Biden administration initiative. The veterans were sworn in as citizens here in San Diego. 
Let me introduce you to our newest citizens. citizens. Hernandez Mata served from 2000 to 2006 and took part in more than 100 combat missions. Contreras enlisted in the Army at 17 and was honorably discharged. Well, Otay Mesa continues to grow as a commerce hub. It's set to expand by an additional 136 acres, bringing new jobs and redevelopment. Two projects announced this week will add significantly more space for warehouses in Otay Mesa. There are also plans to redevelop the Brownfield Airport. Uh, we have a lot of different companies coming and building more buildings here and creating more jobs. So like across the street, we have a brand new Home Depot building and another company that just moved in that's more in the medical manufacturing. Yeah, cross-border trade between San Diego and Tijuana is also expected to further increase with the possible remodel of the Otay Mesa crossing. Well, in President Biden's State of the Union address, he called for social media companies to be held accountable. As our political reporter Morgan Reiner tells us, the president also spoke about an assault weapons ban and other measures in place that are already in the works here in California. President Joe Biden is a Democrat, so a political expert told me that it is no surprise a lot of what he called for last night is already in the works in a supermajority blue state like California. In his State of the Union Tuesday night, President Joe Biden recognized California hero Brandon Say for stopping the Monterey Park mass shooter from continuing his spree. He saved lives. It's time we do the same. Banned assault weapons now. Something UC San Diego political science professor Thad Kauser said California has already done. California has a set of gun control laws that are the strongest in the nation, including an assault rifle ban, which is something he called for at the national level. Biden also called for higher taxes on the rich. Passed my proposal for the billionaire minimum tax. We've passed many taxes in the last few years, often through the initiative process and high income earners, millionaires. And that's what Joe Biden, that's part of his overall tax and spending package that he floated was keeping taxes the same uh, for people making under 400,000, but let's tax the rich. That's again, putting him just in line with where blue California has been. Protecting abortion rights. Congress must restore the right that was taken away and Roe v. Wade and protect Roe v. Wade. California enshrined the right to abortion in November, but some proposals the president mentioned, like the one dealing with social media. We must finally hold social media companies accountable for experimenting or doing running children for profit. Are being discussed in the legislature right now, but there are some limitations. California lawmakers have been reticent to take some of the strongest actions against social media because they're worried about killing the golden goose, right? Let's face it, these, these tech giants, Meta uh, in, in, in Palo Alto, they are part of what feeds California's tax base, what feeds the job base of the Bay Area. President Biden also made it very clear last night that he believes workers have a right to unionize. Now, California does have some of the most union-friendly laws in the entire country, but last year there was a bill to allow staffers within the California capital to unionize. Lawmakers did not pass that bill into law. Kowser said it can't hurt in a way to have the president chime in. Morgan, thanks. And California is dropping its attempt to require all K-12 through students to be vaccinated for COVID in order to attend school. Once again, here's Morgan Reiner, who has what we all need to know. CDPH told us in a statement that with the end of the COVID state of emergency on February 28th, they are no longer exploring a vaccine requirement for California school kids. They said if it was going to happen, it would have to go through the legislature. And right now there are no bills to do it. Political analyst Steve Swat called this moment from October 2021. What we are announcing here today, a statewide requirement for in person instruction where Governor Gavin Newsom announced all 6.7 million public and private school children would need to be vaccinated in order to attend school. The most contentious moment of the entire pandemic. It really separated parents up and down the states, uh, the state. Six months later in April, it was announced that the plan was delayed. As of today, CDPH told me they are not currently exploring emergency rulemaking to add COVID-19 vaccinations to the list of required school vaccinations. There has been that, that 
that pushback from a lot of parents uh, going going back several years. Uh, but I think it was it's a recognition by the health experts that this is much more manageable, that we don't have to have government uh, in control of everything, that the healthcare system can sort of pick up uh, where needed. Jonathan Zacherson is one of the parents that pushed back. He is the founder of Reopen California Schools. Definitely something that I was pleased to hear and something that I thought was going to happen just based off the sentiment. At this point, he just wants to know why there was a press conference to announce the plan, a press release from CDPH when the timeline was being pushed back, but then... I think Newsom and CDPH need to put out a statement uh, to make it crystal clear that the COVID vaccine will not be uh, on the list of vaccines for next school year. Zacherson is frustrated as a parent and as a Roseville School Board member. We get daily communications from the California School Board Association. Uh, they included it from the news outlets on there, but they haven't received anything from the state. It's all been, uh, you know, media like yourself asking CDPH about this. We reached back out to CDPH to see if they plan on putting out a public announcement for all to see. They followed back up saying that they have nothing further to add at this time. In the original statement, however, they did make it very clear they are still strongly recommending that everyone get the COVID-19 vaccine. Morgan, once again, thank you. And as the federal COVID emergency declaration comes to an end, the extra federal assistance in food stamps that hundreds of thousands of San Diegans now rely on will also end. Those emergency allotments from the federal government to the state's CalFresh program will end this month so that families will see the last boost to their benefits next month. This will impact millions of Californians who've come to rely on this extra assistance during the pandemic, especially as inf inflation continues to climb. People are paying record prices for their food, gas, electricity, <laughs> rent, and so this could not come at a, at a worse time. Everyone stands to lose, no matter where you fall in the CalFresh benefits range. Yeah, for more information on both Feeding San Diego and the San Diego Food Bank and the help that they provide our local community, just go to cbs8.com and click on the help button. Well, the public got a chance to listen to and speak with developers for the long awaited Midway Rising redevelopment project to replace the sports arena and the surrounding space. More than 100 nearby residents voiced concerns about the plan for a 16,000 seat new sports arena, as well as over 4,000 condos, a hotel and shopping area. Most complaints were about overcrowding, traffic and the homeless. All you see is people strung out on drugs, walking around, laying on sidewalks, living in tents, stealing. That's what's going on. Talk to somebody, talk to anybody. We as a team, the Midway Rising team, are committed to understanding the traffic and transportation issues that exist, finding solutions with the consultants we bring to the table and the local jurisdictions that currently exist. Yeah, now this was the first of several public town hall meetings the developers plan to hold over the next two years. And we are hearing from UC San Diego grad students about six weeks after their strike over unfair working conditions. Thousands of students across the state reached a deal with the University of California, but some students say people are retaliating against them for going on strike. More than 20 UCSD students say they received unsatisfactory grades for their research or TA classes. The unsatisfactory or U grade given to them by their professor can have a lasting impact. We can fall out of proper academic standing, which threatens our ability to continue working at these at UC San Diego and to receive our PhD. Along with that, it means that we are going to have to TA for more quarters. Yeah, retaliating against grad students for striking is illegal in California. Students have filed grievances with the school to get the U grades changed. UCSD says it is following appropriate procedures on how to respond. Well, parts of a beach campground will be off limits over fears of a possible bluff collapse. The popular San Alejo State Beach park rangers there are taping off areas near unstable bluffs by the south end of the campgrounds. That area has suffered major erosion from recent storms and abnormally high waves, which is removing more sand than normal from the beaches, making the coastline less protected.
a cliff is an equilibrium situation. Gravity's pulling on it, ocean waves are beating on it, collapsing is inevitable. And the collapse is accentuated during times of heavy rainfall. Yeah, recent cliff collapses along San Diego's coast had some factors in common, heavy rain and big surf. Well, empty storefronts and leasing available signs have some mall goers worried about the future of Parkway Plaza. CBS 8's Brian White visited the mall in El Cajon to talk with people and business owners about what's in store. With a number of vacant storefronts here at Parkway Plaza, many people are wondering what the future holds for this shopping mall and will it suffer the same fate as Horton Plaza? Stores are closing all over the place and we're wondering what's going on. And she's not alone. A lot of people are noticing the empty storefronts here in the mall. Looks like about one out of every three. That's what it looks like to me, one out of every four. Donnie Roberson has lived in the area for 71 years. He actually used to work here at a store called Chess King Clothing that's no longer here. But he's noticed this place change over the decades. Uh, it used to be packed. Now it's to nobody. He, like a lot of folks, actually come here in the morning to exercise. You take two trips around, it's around 40 minutes. Christine Mendoza is a bit worried. She loves this place for the shopping and exercise. I've heard rumors it's going to turn into condos and you know, we just don't need that around here. We need a mall. I couldn't confirm any of that with mall management. As far as I know, there are no plans to close the mall, but obviously times are tough and they're actively recruiting businesses to fill some of these vacant stores. Mary Conca has been here at Parkway for 32 years with her quaint little business, Caramel Corn. It's challenging for everyone, you know? And, and when you have stores like when Macy's closed, that was a big hit. Macy's closed here nearly two years ago, and now the fate of the Regal Cinemas Theater is up in the air as negotiations are still ongoing. Obviously, less foot traffic makes business here at Parkway more challenging. With inflation, the cost of payroll, the cost of property, the interest rates, everything has made retail more difficult. Mary says the pandemic really hit businesses hard and online shopping trends are always tough to compete with, but overall, she's optimistic about the future here at Parkway. I think that the, this mall stands a real good chance of recovering. It's just going to take time like everything else. It's, good. it's not going to happen overnight. At Parkway Plaza, Brian White, CBSA. She's got a good attitude there. Brian, thanks. Well, the nonprofit Urban Street Angels announced it's putting in new emergency beds at its shelter downtown. It'll give 20 young people experiencing homelessness a new place to sleep off the streets. It's adding 20 beds in addition to the 50 beds already at the shelter. They are funded by a $500,000 grant from the Behavioral Health Impact Fund, which is a partnership between the city and county of San Diego. The new beds will be available starting on February 15th. Well, a warning for homeowners, a South American gang that targets high-end homes might be back in San Diego. A North County family just had their home near Black Mountain Ranch burglarized on Thursday. The intruders busted through their glass back door and ransacked the house. The family says they've heard about two more homes that were broken into not far from that neighborhood as well. Last year, a crime ring was responsible for a string of burglaries targeting wealthy San Diego homes. The ring is known to authorities as the South American Theft Group. They broke into homes in Rancho Santa Fe, Del Mar, Encinitas, and Chula Vista, stealing cash, jewelry, and purses. We have all the motion sensor lights, we have a dog, we left lights on, we had our alarm set, yeah. so this really could happen to anyone. Yeah, we'll be following their investigation and bring you updates as this story develops. Well, a San Diego man who spent most of his life on the open water says a botched eye surgery has left him in the dark. Last year, Tom Hirsch went in for cataract surgery at Specialist Surgery Center in Del Mar. He says the surgery left him partially blind because of a condition called toxic anterior segment syndrome, which can be caused by dirty medical tools. He is filing a civil lawsuit claiming the center is responsible for giving nine other patients this condition. There are protocols that need to be followed, sterilization procedures that need to be followed, and that just simply did not happen in this case. What happened to Tom Hirsch was absolutely preventable. It really was a failure on so many different levels. 
Yet again, Tom says he grew up on the water and wanted to sail out his golden years, but says that is not possible anymore. Well, Bed Bath & Beyond is closing even more of its stores. The chain now says it's shutting down 150 more stores after announcing it's closing 87. Three of the six stores in San Diego are closing. Those are on East H Street in Chula Vista, Mission Gorge Road in Santee, and Forest Commons Drive in San Diego. A San Diego State University marketing professor says Bed Bath & Beyond likely fell victim to online shopping. Stores that were really developed to kind of own a category have really struggled over the last few years, especially in the face of Amazon, online sellers, and mass merchants like Walmart and Target. They're mostly standalone or in B or C level malls, so traffic to those malls have declined. Yeah, we saw it with Parkway Plaza, Horton Plaza as well. Bed Bath & Beyond has not said how many workers the closures will affect. Well, this week we got a unique look inside the Navy. The military branch invited CBS 8 Steve Price to its base in Norfolk, Virginia to better understand the daily life of a sailor. It also gave him a firsthand look at the situations they face and the training they get to make sure that they are prepared for the worst. Here's more from San Diego stationed all the way on the other side of the country. Welcome to Naval Station Norfolk. With over 46,000 active duty sailors and 21,000 civilians, this is the largest naval complex in the entire world. And this week, it's my home for their Sailor for a Day program, where we get to give you an inside look into the daily life of a Navy sailor. It's music to the ears of those looking for adventure, purpose, and opportunities for advancement. And among those taking advantage of all the Navy has to offer. My name is Serena Espinoza, I'm QM1, and I'm from Oceanside, California. I'm IT2 Isaiah Salcedo from Chula Vista, California. I studied journalism and media studies at San Diego State. San Diegans stationed in Norfolk, making a difference. From helicopters, to hovercraft. Imagine that there's burning fuel up on the surface. Survival training to submarines. So come right. San Diego and share what life is really like and what they miss from home. The food, the culture. It's really hard finding authentic Mexican food <laughs> anywhere outside of California. The first thing I learned is that sailors have several uniforms, and even though they have very little space in their room, all of them are required on deployment. This uniform I'm wearing is relatively new to the Navy. It's called Tupac. It'll be the primary at sea uniform and is both lightweight and fire resistant. The next fire is going to be our flashover and our switchboards. Which is good because Chula Vista's Pedro Silva, stationed on a submarine, says fires happen more than you think. I have had to f fight one fire and I've just been a part of or been here for at least four more. You really do have to be ready for everything like my flight in an MH60 Sierra helicopter. Weather made visibility tricky and when I tried to talk about the experience on camera, it didn't go so well. Turns out they're louder than you realize. By the way, if these helicopters look familiar, it's because we have them in San Diego too. In fact, here's video of them helping to fight our 2007 wildfires and making rescues after hurricanes and other dangerous storms. Hey, the fact that our primary mission is rescuing people is pretty motivating. I enjoy the fact that you know people get to go home and see their families at the end of the day because we do our job. If you're not a fan of flying, how about gliding in a hovercraft, or as the Navy calls them, LCAT for landing craft air cushion. They can transport 500 Marines at a time. It will take Marines from the ship to shore, and we can do it at such a fast pace compared to other nations uh, that we can really build up a huge force ashore very quickly. They can travel over 50 knots on water and safely hit beaches around the world that other boats can't. But what really surprised me on my quick ride was how smooth they are. This is a cool way to travel. Adrenaline always gets pumping no matter how many times you ride. Fire. 
tomorrow, we're going to take you aboard the Navy's newest aircraft carrier, show you what it's like to live and work on one without missing a beat. When in doubt, just go boom, 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 boom. Got it. Which brings us back to the music you heard earlier. The Navy ceremonial band is filled with accomplished musicians chosen through a competitive audition process to travel the country, playing at everything from ceremonies with high-ranking officials to community events. Hanging out with them definitely ended my first day of sailor training with a bang. At Naval Station Norfolk, Steve Price, CBS 8. I am beyond impressed. That is so cool to see. What an opportunity, Steve. So now to Navy submarines. They are occasionally spotted in our bay, but what's it like to live on one? If you are claustrophobic, this is definitely not the job for you. Here again is Steve Price. Imagine living 400 feet below the surface in a confined space for months at a time. For today's day in the life of a sailor training, we're gonna take you on board a submarine, but first, some full disclosure. Because of top secret equipment on board the USS Albany, all the video you see inside the submarine was shot and cleared by the Navy. But even with those restrictions, you can still tell this is not the place for someone who's claustrophobic. Well, it gets really cramped, it's really tight, um, and you know, you, you have to figure out how to get along with people. You're kind of getting in your way here. And forget about privacy and personal space. This tiny room has nine beds, but actually sleeps more than a dozen through a process called hot racking, where three sailors working different shifts share two beds. Unfortunately, there's not enough room on a sub to give all 120 sailors on board their own place to sleep. It is what it is. Sometimes you get stinky people, but you kind of live with it. We use a lot of car air fresheners. Chula Vista native Pedro Silva says everyone is so busy on a submarine, the days actually fly by pretty fast. Living on board, it, it, um, it's kind of like a time machine actually. So when you go down, you kind of lose all track of time just because of our tight schedule. They bring enough food to be self-sufficient for 90 days, but forget about phone calls home. It's our only way of communication is just emails generally, so. And depending where you are, you may go weeks without an internet connection because the whole point of a sub is to not do anything that can get you noticed. This is the way you gotta think about it. Everyone's trying to hit you when you're the submarine and your job is to make sure that they can't hit you. One way to hide, find swimming shrimp. They're so loud in the ocean, they can throw off the enemy. And if that doesn't work... This is the torpedo room. This is uh, the uh, weaponry, the majority of the weaponry that we carry on board the submarine. Green means they're explosive, but beyond that, we weren't given many specifics. We were also prohibited from showing you the Albany's control room, but we can show you this submarine control simulator where we learned how to navigate the vessel. We'll go down to uh, 300. From my seat, I control the sub going up and down. The person next to me, left and right, it's relatively stress-free when everything is going smoothly, but on a submarine, you can suddenly have leaks that must be fixed while the vessel is underwater and fires, which happen more than you think on a submarine, usually in the dryer, and they don't have firefighters on board to put them out. If something goes wrong, you have to be able to deal with it yourself, which is why everybody uh, is a damage control uh, person on the submarine. Everyone does damage control. Surface ships, you've got guys who that is their job on a submarine, everyone does it. Submariner life isn't easy, which is why they get a bonus for agreeing to do it. But if this definitely isn't for you, maybe this is more your style. In our next Sailor for a Day story, learning how to protect dangerous waterways half a world away at Naval Station Norfolk. Steve Price, CBS 8. Once again, so impressive. You can catch more of that series on CBS8.com. My sincere thank you for your service.
And this Super Bowl Sunday, for the first time ever, the national anthem flyover will be performed exclusively by female pilots. Lieutenants Lindsay Evans and Jackie Drew say that they've been practicing for weeks to get the split second timing just right for Sunday. Female aviation has come a long way over the decades. It's been 50 years since the first set of female naval aviators got their wings. All of us are in combat deployable airplanes, have participated in combat deployable uh, squadrons and have been on operational deployments, which is a huge stride. And a lot of the work that they did 50 years ago means that we don't even have to think about it when we go to work. Yeah, really good stuff there. Lieutenants Evans and Drew will make their appearance just as the anthem is ending. Well, a citrus quarantine is in place now in Rancho Bernardo. The city of San Diego found an incurable and deadly plant disease among the trees there. The quarantine means that people should not pick up any citrus fruit from trees in that area and take them elsewhere. The disease was first confirmed in the county back in 2021 in Oceanside. The bacterial disease won't hurt humans or animals, but it will kill your trees. It'll stop producing edible fruit, so the fruit will become very rancid tasting. It will never fully ripen. Uh, so, yeah, if you are concerned about trees on your property, head to CBS8.com to find out how you can get them tested. Well, the Golden Poppy Super Bloom, remember it? It was such a beautiful sight that sadly ended in some ugly chaos in 2019. Now, it might be happening again. We sent our Brian White on a road trip. I hit the road and headed north on I-15 after reports of golden poppy sightings. A few miles out from Lake Elsinore, I caught my first glimpse of golden poppies peppering the hillsides with that golden orange hue. Okay, so I just pulled up to the Walker Canyon Trailhead. As you can see, it's closed off to the public, but park rangers are going to let me walk in just a little bit to give you a closer view. Golden poppies are blooming here in Walker Canyon in all their brilliance and colorful displays. It's like a little yellow orange pop of sunshine. Jeff and Gail here came out to see the poppies, but were turned around by park rangers. Very disappointed. Doesn't seem like there's really any good reason for it to be closed. They were here for the super bloom in 2019 and shared these pictures with me. It was incredible. Pretty much the whole hills were covered with flowers and you were able to walk through them. This season, the city of Lake Elsinore decided to shut down Walker Canyon Trail altogether in order to prevent the massive crowds seen in 2019. Neighborhoods were literally severed from access to the rest of the city by traffic gridlock. They also coned off the I-15 shoulder to prevent onlookers from parking along the freeway. There was people parking like idiots and causing traffic jams and everything else. The freeway was at a dead stop. With everything shut down, the city is asking people to exercise their puppy patience. They're probably one of the most iconic species for super blooms. Dr. Daniel Winkler is a research ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey's Southwest Biological Science Center. And he says the massive amounts of rain last month are partly why we're seeing these early blooms. It depends on how much rain fell in a particular area, but also if the seeds in the soil seed bank were primed and ready for receiving that precipitation to create a wildflower display. As for whether this will become a super bloom, that may depend on how much rain we get over the next few weeks. In Lake Elsinore, Brian White, CBS 8. Four San Diegans deal with food scarcity in our can county. There is a local organization working to combat this issue through produce collection and helping you to grow your own food to build up our community. Chief Meteorologist Carlene Chavis went to Encinitas to check out the workshop and get her hands a little dirty in this Earth 8 report. The San Diego Botanic Garden isn't just a pretty place. They are working to save the planet and feed our bellies. There's a workshop here that's available to you. And guess what? You don't even need to have a green thumb. I started as a, I'm just going to call it an unseasoned gardener <laughs> instead of a black thumb. Yes. And, you know, I just love teaching people, you know, what I've learned through my research and trial and error and hopefully 
um, really help them have success and kill less plants than I have killed. And this green thumb guru is a garden full of knowledge to help you. Min Michaelov is the CEO and president of Healthy Day Partners. This organization is working to end local hunger through teaching people to grow food at home, in addition to improving public health. Sponsored by the city of Encinitas, she teaches the Grow Food and Hunger Save the Planet workshop at the San Diego Botanic Garden. And in this class, Mim hooks you up. A really beautiful set of gardening tools in a reusable produce bag. Oh my goodness. They'll get seed packets uh -huh. and a resource guide as well as a planting guide to help you know when to plant things, like what is the right time to plant. Okay. And as you said, a secret preservation process that I'm not going to disclose at the you moment. Got, you gotta show up. And of course, you gotta dig in and get your hands dirty. So you're gonna put a hole in the middle of that. Sure. There you go. And then you're gonna plop this guy right in there oh. with his nice loose root so that he can like stretch out and grow big. But the workshop is not only about gardening tips. You also get tips on living a zero waste lifestyle. Take a tour of the San Diego Botanic Garden's incredible edible garden and learn more about a program called Homegrown Hunger Relief. Think of it as a donation station for excess food. Every Sunday in the main parking lot, this green cooler is set up with ice packs and towels for produce drop off and the food goes directly to feeding agencies in the community. Somebody's excess is bringing access to some to children and seniors and active military and veterans and people who are truly food insecure. Love with a big green heart to hear it, Mim. And you'll love to hear this. All of this green knowledge is free. No, really, it's free. Since the workshop is sponsored by the city of Encinitas, your $10 deposit when you sign up for class is refunded to you when you, well, show up for class. Mwah, chef's kiss. I checked the website and the next class on Saturday, February 11th is full, but you can sign up for future classes on the second Saturday for the next few months. They're from 10 a.m. to noon. Grow food and hunger, save the planet. It's as easy as that. Two green thumbs up, Mim. For CBS 8, I'm Chief Meteorologist Carlene Chavis. Great program, Carlene. Truly, thank you for shedding some light. Well, before we leave you, the National City Taco Stand Man, who went viral, is thanking the community for helping him reach his dreams. Teodoro Jimenez's life has changed since he was featured in a viral TikTok video when someone tipped him $1,000. Now Jimenez says his stand sells out almost every day. And to GoFundMe, he started to help him buy a taco truck, now has more than $25,000. He says he's grateful for the support. Thank you for having me. Everybody, thank you, thank you. And I appreciate it. Everybody appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ah, well deserved. So while Jimenez's recipe is a secret, the one tip that he can share is that he makes each meal with all of his heart. As always, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for staying informed. Be sure to join me each week as I take you around San Diego. For CBS 8, I'm Jenny Day. Take such good care of yourself.